Hi, welcome to another episode of Can Silicon Valley Solve Healthcare? I'm your host, Adam Silverman, Chief Medical Officer at Syllable. Today, we have the square off between a real practicing physician, a senior clinician, and we are going to pit him versus Chat GPT, Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University, Bob Harrington. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, thanks for having me, Adam. This ought to be fun. I'm treating this as we would on rounds, that uh, you can present me a case and I'll respond to it like I would if I were making rounds with the residents and the fellows. So I'm looking forward to it. Thrilled to just jump in and I think that's exactly what we're going to do. So um, you can feel free to pimp me all you want, but I'm going to present the cases to you and let's just jump right into them. So case number one, a 64-year-old black man with a history of poorly controlled blood pressure begins to complain about fatigue, progressive shortness of breath with exertion, and swollen legs. What's going on here? You know, when you start to hear shortness of breath, you start to hear fatigue, you start to hear swollen legs, you're thinking this is likely or possibly a cardiac issue that could be of a couple of ilks. It could be that the heart muscle is not pumping like it should. Uh, the swollen legs also suggests that there's some some problem with the way the heart muscle's pumping because that happens in the setting when, if you will, the pressure builds up on the right side of the heart and you see things like uh, swollen legs. The shortness of breath could be because there's uh, congestion fluid in the lungs uh, and again would suggest heart muscle not pumping. Did the high blood pressure lead to worsening heart function? Or is the high blood pressure poorly controlled a bit of a red herring here? And what you're really thinking about is, uh, you know, bread and butter coronary artery disease because he's the right age in his early 60s. He's got a history of hypertension. I'd want to know his other risk factors. Does he smoke? Does he have diabetes? Do we know what his cholesterol is? What about his family history? So I'm going to put my nickel down, Adam, that this is likely hypertension induced heart failure, probably. Um, heart failure would preserve dejection fraction, meaning that the heart gets thicker in response to blood pressure and that the dyspnea exertion is uh, because of uh, heart failure. Um, but I'm not going to rule out the possibility of coronary artery disease that's underlying this as well. You know, one of the reasons that I presented this relatively undifferentiated case is I wanted to see if ChatGPT would know about differential diagnosis. So let me tell you what ChatGPT said about this case. It starts out as it does with most of its um, clinical questions that I pose to it, which is, I'm not a doctor, but the symptoms you describe may suggest that the individual could be experiencing congestive heart failure or another cardiovascular issue. Poorly controlled blood pressure can lead to heart problems, which could explain the fatigue, shortness of breath, and swelling in the legs. Other potential causes to consider, and here's the differential diagnosis, chronic kidney disease, venous insufficiency, or liver disease. What do you think? I think it's pretty good. And I, I particularly like the addition. Um, it was something that was in my brain about uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, that black patients have a higher risk of chronic kidney disease than white patients. Uh, poorly controlled hypertension is one of the biggest risk factors for um, the development of chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease can present with fatigue and fluid retention. So that that's a nice addition to the uh, to the differential diagnosis. Let's move on to case number two of Doc versus ChatGPT. 35-year-old IV drug user begins to complain about fevers, chills, fast heart rate, fatigue, night sweats, aching joints and muscles, a persistent cough, and again, swelling in the feet. What's going on here? So again, the same exercise, a lot of questions I'd like to know about onset, duration, um, actually habits of uh, IV drug abuse, meaning are you still actively using drugs? You know, do you share needles? Do you, are these dirty needles, clean needles? So there's a lot of stuff. I'd like to know in terms of my history taking. And this is one where physical exam is going to be, you know, really important. What you do by starting off with 35 year old IV drug user, all of a sudden, ding, 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 sounds like endocarditis for the cardiologist, meaning an infection of the heart valve that can accompany the injection of foreign material into the bloodstream. And an infection can take place on the heart valves in an IV drug user, most typically on the valves on the right side of the heart, the cuspid valve. A couple of interesting things here that uh, the physical exam would point to. You talk about the fever, you'd like to know, well, when is that? And that just may be an infection. But you also talk about the uh, some joint aches and pains. And, you know, one of the things about endocarditis that's so problematic is that these infections get on the valve. And then for a variety of reasons, mostly mechanical in nature, with just sheer forces from the blood flow, uh, pieces of it can break off. 
and can um, go down to another uh, part of the body, including the joints, including the fingers, the, uh, the toes, uh, unfortunately, to the brain. Um, unfortunately, down to the heart arteries themselves. So there's a lot on physical exam. And then there's some classic physical examination findings you'd like to look at. You'd like to look at the fingernails to see what's called the peripheral stigmata of endocarditis. Um, and, and as you start to do that, you might get a better sense of whether or not it is in fact endocarditis. In the spirit of uh, placing the bet, I'll place my bet on endocarditis um, in this I, young IV drug user, but I'm not ruling out other things yet. And I definitely want to examine this patient. We have so much to talk about and just not enough time. But let me tell you what ChatGPT had to say about this um, unfortunate 35 year old. Again, I'm not a doctor. But the symptoms you described in the context of IV drug use could suggest a, a potential case of infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is an infection of the inner lining of the heart chambers and valves, often caused by bacteria entering the bloodstream. IV drug users are at an increased risk of developing this condition due to the potential contamination of needles and injection sites. However, these symptoms could also be indicative of other conditions such as pneumonia, septicemia, or other systemic infections, and treatment would depend on the specific diagnosis and may include antibiotic supportive care and possibly sur surgical intervention in, in severe cases. Not bad. You know, I think it's a, it's a reasonable approximation of, a, of an explanation. Yeah, I mean, what, what I particularly like about it is that it didn't only stick with endocarditis. It did what I did, which is said, you know, don't go down that trap of uh, only thinking of one thing. All right. Case number three of Dr. Harrington v. ChatGPT. 85-year-old, previously healthy woman comes to you complaining of shortness of breath walking into the bathroom. On further questioning, she reports occasional chest pain walking upstairs and has had several fainting episodes. What's going on? Uh, so this is this is an interesting one. This is one where I really want to know the cardiac risk factors and what does she really mean by previously healthy? Because I can go in several directions here. I could go down what I'll call the coronary ischemic heart disease pathway. Uh, ischemic heart disease, what makes me think of that? Well, she's 85. That by itself puts you at increased risk of coronary artery disease. I'd like to know her other risk factors. Does she smoke? Does she have diabetes? Does she have hypertension? Then I'm also thinking about an 85-year-old lady but with both shortness of breath and occasional chest pain is uh, aortic valve disease. Um, aortic valve disease is common as we get older. Uh, it can present in a lot of ways. The classic symptomatic presentation of aortic stenosis is three different symptoms. It's, uh, it's chest pain, it's shortness of breath, and it's syncope, fainting. So I'm thinking ischemic heart disease, I'm thinking valvular heart disease, uh, particularly aortic stenosis. So this one I'm really interested in hearing where my, uh, where my computer friend is going. All right, so let's see what ChatGPT thought yeah. about our 85-year-old lady. So again, they're not a physician. They said one possibility might be aortic stenosis, which is what, exactly what you said, um, and confirms that the symptoms of aortic stenosis, the three classic symptoms that you just reported. And then they go on to say, but however, these symptoms could also be indicative of other conditions, such as coronary artery disease, heart failure, and arrhythmia. It doesn't specifically say bradyarrhythmia, but I'll give, them, I'll give them credit for the arrhythmias. Well, now it's time to sort of test um, whether ChatGPT has the ability to perhaps look at exceptions or whether it can somehow provide or execute judgment. Because I want to continue on the case with, uh, a with aortic stenosis, and I want to ask you the question of what's the correct course of treatment for a 95-year-old woman with severe aortic stenosis and dementia? And dementia? Does that change? Does that yeah. change? Does the addition of the advanced age and the dementia affect the recommendation that a cardiologist would make or the heart team would make in this particular case? Maybe. So you know that replacing the valve, that's the best quantitative information, that replacing that valve is uh, going to likely improve longevity, improve symptoms. Well, you're 95 and how much do you care about longevity is really a question for the patient. It, it doesn't rule out 95 without dementia. Certainly fixing the aortic valve might be quite reasonable depending upon the lifestyle that they lead and uh, what they want to continue to do in the years ahead. The dementia gets a little trickier. How demented? Is this somebody who's bedridden and uh, caretaker dependent? In which case you might try to really concentrate on that person being comfortable and uh, maybe even palliative care. And that may well be the right choice. So I'm gonna say, depending upon where we are on the scale of dementia and their care needs, 
and what their individual values as a preferences are, um, that could send you in two different directions. Less, less severe, I'd be willing to consider it, meaning fix the valve. More severe, I might focus on palliative care and comfort. So I was really curious to see how, how GPT was going to handle this. Primary treatment goals uh, would likely be to manage symptoms and improve quality of life. But some considerations for the patient's care may include medical management, aortic valve interventions, which is what you mentioned, um, both surgical and, and transcatheter aortic. However, it says in a 95-year-old patient with dementia, the risks associated with these procedures may outweigh the potential benefits. A thorough evaluation of the patient's overall health and the potential for improvement in quality of life should be considered before pursuing these options. The third arm of its recommendation was exactly what you said, which is palliative care. And the only criticism that I have at this is that it doesn't specifically call out and what the patient's choice is in, yeah. in all of this. But it otherwise gives you a pretty thoughtful answer, right. including focusing, you know, as I said, I think I said some of the effect of, you know, at 95, longevity may not be the issue. And chat GPT said it more specifically. They said, well, quality of life. Right. And, uh, and that is often the trade-off you're talking about is, uh, is years, years plus or minus quality of life. Okay, we're gonna shift gears here for case number five. Um, we're gonna bring you back to your New England roots. So a 45 year old man with history of smoking presents with syncope. Social history reveals that he's married with three kids and two dogs. He frequently hikes through the woods of Connecticut. He runs 10 miles a day, five days per week, and he drinks two beers a day. Evaluation, however, reveals complete heart block. <laughs> what is the likely diagnosis? Yeah, th 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 this is one where you wanna definitely be careful. Uh, because there's some things which are like going, woo, 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 think of me, uh, Woods, Connecticut uh, being the big ones, um, heart block being associated with that. Um, but then, you know, again, you don't want to forget common things being common, right? What's the old, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. Right. And um, because where the zebra is in this is, uh, is Lyme disease. And Lyme disease can cause a myocarditis, uh, infection and inflammation of the heart. Um, if that inflammation involves the septum, which is where the electrical signal of the heart travels through from the upper chamber to the lower chamber, you can present with heart block. But there's a lot of other stuff I'd like to think about here because that's sort of the, whoa, that's the interesting, that's the inter that's the morning report diagnosis. Right, it's residents right. all hope it is so they can talk about it at morning report. So I think there's a lot of things uh, yeah. In my differential here, but the one that the one that excites me is the possibility of Lyme and myocarditis and uh, septal involvement in complete heart block. So I need to ask a whole bunch more questions. I need to do some laboratory tests. I need to examine them, obviously. Yeah, when I got to this part of my experimentation with GPT in preparation of this, I wanted to stump GPT. I wanted to see, you know, what can I give it that it won't get? Now, I was leading because I, I, I mentioned Connecticut in, in the woods, and you're absolutely right. The, the, the diagnosis behind this case is Lyme carditis and chat GPT picks it up immediately. Um, the information you provided suggests that this uh, complete heart block might uh, have been due to Lyme uh, carditis as a potential diagnosis. And then it goes on to describe Lyme carditis just like you did and you know all the associated um, pathophysiology that goes along with it. it. It says there then, but we have to consider other things, but it doesn't give us those other things. It goes on to outline what the appropriate evaluation should be. So I, I, it's not bad. Well, it's not bad in particular what this, you know, the, here's the learning tool that let's say for the sake of argument, you're not a senior clinician and you kind of remember that there's something about Connecticut and tick bites and, but you're not quite getting it. And chat GPT says Lyme and then that just unleashes your brain to say, right. oh, of course, I I'm actually impressed at how it doesn't have, as you rightly note, anchoring bias so much. It, right. it, it gives you its leading, you know, it's it's thinking probabilistically, like what's the most probable here? Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and, and then, you know, as a senior person, you're always thinking, yeah, but let's not miss like these other things and let's not go so far down the trap of Lyme that we don't think about other things. Right. On the next case, I wanted to see if it could be an assistant um, to you in the cath lab. Well, it's, I guess it's not you. This would be somebody who's probably used to, not, be, you, you, used to be me. Not so skilled and maybe a little clumsy in the cath lab. So case number okay. six of doc versus okay. GBT. During a routine PTCA, you lose control of the wire and it slips into the IVC. What do you do? So the IVC is the inferior vena cava. It's on the right side of the heart, the venous side of the heart. And 
we sometimes are on both sides of the heart during a procedure. Maybe it's to give people volume. Maybe it's because you're also doing a right heart cath. But you can lose a wire. And uh, let's say for the sake of argument, you lost a wire on the uh, in the IVC. First off, you're far away from the balloon angioplasty procedure, so you're okay with that, but you got to get it out. And there's a lot of ways to think about this, one of which is that you could put in uh, a different type of catheter, uh, go up, then catheters have snare devices on them. It's like snaring them. And you could actually go up with a snare device, capture this thing, and pull it out through a big sheath. This, this one involves some, uh, some, some technical manipulation, we'll call it. So you, you schooled me appropriately. I completely missed my uh, anatomical snafu and putting the IVC into the PTCA, but you're absolutely right. Um, unfortunately, GPT didn't pick up that piece. It played along with me, which is kind of interesting, but it has some interesting advice if this happens to you. Yeah. The number one thing it says to do is to keep calm and maintain a <laughs> sterile environment. It's important to stay focused and ensure patient safety throughout the procedure. Number two, try to retrieve the guide wire, wire using your catheter. Gently maneuver the catheter to engage the guide wire and attempt to pull it back into the desired position. I think that's your snaring. Yeah. If unsuccessful with the initial catheter, consider using specialized devices such as snares, gooseneck loops, or other retrieval systems. Consult with experienced colleagues or specialists in, diff in difficult cases. If all minimally invasive methods fail to retrieve the guide wire, surgical intervention might be necessary. And then lastly, throughout the procedure, monitor the patient's vital signs and provide appropriate medical management to ensure their safety and comfort. I think ChatGPT and an intern now are ready to do percutaneous angioplasty. You know, they gave, there's some great pearls there, I would say, in, uh, in the machine's answer. Uh, you got to stay calm. Uh, remember, it's not you that's dying. And uh, so in the cath lab, it's really important to remain calm for your reason, for, for the sake of you being able to concentrate for, the, for your team, not panicking and being able to help you. And for the patient, obviously, most importantly, to stay well. So I think that's a great piece of advice. In a great cath lab, people work together and are happy to help each other. So that's a great answer by the machine. Well, Bob, I can't thank you enough for being part of this. I, I would score <laughs> this, <laughs> although I would score this a statistical tie, I still would give the win to you as um, your insight and your unwillingness to anchor to a particular diagnosis and to provide a reasonable differential diagnosis, I think was far superior than what ChatGPT was able to offer today. Um, but I was really impressed with, with some of these findings and this was fun. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, I hope maybe uh, sometime in the not too distant future, we can bring you back and have a, a, a regular old conversation about your experiences in healthcare. Yeah, no, I'd love that. And uh, I did enjoy this and I, I'm obviously following the area with interest, both from actually from all three perspectives. I think about academic medicine as clinical care, research and education. And there's going to be utility here across all of those. We, we're clearly going to be able to use it to educate people. We're clearly going to be able to do interesting research. And I, I think it's going to end up being a helpful addition to the um, to the care armamentarium. I, you know, I, heck, I look stuff up off the, all the time. Why wouldn't right. I just not chat GPT exactly. to help me? Yeah, exactly. Robert Harrington, MD, clinician extraordinaire. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Adam. I really appreciate it. It was fun.